Welcome to Running in the 70s, where we interview, meet, and get to know athletes of all kind who were running in the 70s. I'm your host, Matthew Kleinoski. Today on the podcast, we're out in California with somebody who you might remember from a very famous race. Almost everybody remembers this race. It's 1984, 3,000 meters in the Olympics, and an American woman collides with another runner and goes down on the track. She got up and finished the race. What? That's not what you remember? Well, it's what happened. Welcome today on the podcast, Running in the 70s, Joan Hansen. Hi, Joan. Hi, good afternoon for you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, John, (laughs) let's start with your early life story. How did you become a competitive athlete? The word competitive is a fascinating word for me because I wasn't born innately competitive in any way. And I'll explain this. Two of us came out as mirror twins. And we were a surprise for our parents and for the doctor. Simultaneous heartbeats, identical twins, left-handed, right-handed. Instead of thinking competitive, our energy level is one of daring excellence. So we didn't really think to be competitive. And I think that's a very good reason that we both could thrive next to each other like a lot of other twins. As you did get into competition, when did that start? We got into performances. So if you think of a stage, most people would think the stage are the actors are on the stage and that's who you're watching perform. But the reality is the entire building and all of the people part of that process are creating the performance. If you take out the people sitting in the seats with their reactions, you have really just a dress rehearsal. And it's a non-hierarchical format that we innately are wired to think. When I explain that on the starting line of life, we stand next to each other with the same common goal of doing our best, I think that would be agreed upon by people around me. And when people attempt to compete, which is a taught process, they put someone else in front of them. So their eyesight actually gets away from what they're focusing on and gets distracted by another person's outcome abilities. And then people can diminish or race in such a way that they are maybe not as effective and and could end up changing the course of the race as it did in my Olympics. The sport that you excelled in first, was it swimming with you and your sister? Yes. And... The the reason that swimming was the sport of choice was because we lived in Arizona where a pool is in every backyard. Our parents owned a business and our brother, who's six years older, decided to start swimming at age 16, which meant he could drive, which meant that we could go to his group's workouts instead of people our own age. And it was a way for him to keep an eye on us and not really keep Oh, that was easy. We were too tired. (laughs) What was your best accomplishment, you and your sister, in high school? We swam high school as part of the boys' team our senior year. We didn't realize Title IX had... We uh, had a new swim coach who was also a counselor at the high school. Joy and I walked into his office at the beginning of our senior year and asked if we could join the team since our times were at the level of the the guys. And he said, yes. So then we talked to other girls joining the team. And then with girls in swimsuits, you can imagine the number of boys that ended up coming out from the team. So our record went from 3.7 to 8.2 when we joined the team. And the really neat thing that happened from that is that our story was shared in the newspaper so that two other high schools, Central and Camelback, did the same thing. And this wasn't girls swimming with girls. This was humans on the starting blocks together, racing next to each other. Was there resistance to this from anyone? No, actually it was terrific. So the boys teams and then the, um, what do you call them when they're androgynous teams? 
I don't know if it's co-ed because we're racing as a boys team. These were all one gender we were racing. We raced as a gender. That's how they, that's how they put the results in as the gender guys. They just had humans on the team. And then the following year, they separated and had a girls team and a boys team. So we actually had a rarity. We had an opportunity to be part of something that was a big family of excellence on this wonderful team. And we were encouraging of everybody out there. So it was a fantastic experience. That was the first girls team at that high school in swimming. It was a girls team and a boys team. There were two right. teams. Our year, it was one generic team racing men, boys. You were never on that girls team. No. And w we grew up with a style of d initiating things that sort of isn't normal. We thought it was, but we're realizing it's not necessarily normal. When they were eight years old, we talked the other kids into helping us clean up a vacant lot after I jumped down off a fence onto a bottle neck that had been broken and it went through my shoe into my foot. And so we thought it'd be nicer to have a park so no one else went through that. And that's what we all did. The high school team wasn't really any different. It was something that we thought would be fun. and. We were fast enough. Why wouldn't we be on that team? And we had no idea Title IX existed. We just thought it made sense that if you can swim fast enough, you could be part of this team. And what did you think would happen with your swimming once you finished high school? Did it have a vision beyond that to compete on a higher level? So if I change the word compete to perform and people get that out okay. of this podcast, that's so nice. That's because great. Performance is the best you can get. It's not participating. It's not competing. It's really excellent. And it's supported. It's shared excellence with people next to you. It's awesome. I went to college and joined the swim team there. And then during dry lands, a, a portion of time before the actual swimming starts where they do dry land drills and have you go out and run on land, Joy happened to be spotted by a coach on the, the men's team, and he suggested that she join the women's team. And so Joy switched sports her freshman year and joined the cross-country team. And I took longer. I didn't really like running. I, I, I enjoyed swimming. And so I, it took me until the following year to change sports. My incentive to change sports was because of a hairdryer. I didn't have to dry my hair twice a day. <laughs> and that was my catalyst to walk onto a track team at U of A, the University of Arizona. Were you a walk-on to the swim team also? Yes, we both were walk-ons on the team. And the reason being that we ended up stopping the AAU swimming, and then we got into doing other activities, theater, music, in high school. And it got too busy to do swimming before and after school by a certain point. So when we were 15, we weren't swimming any longer as AAU. We were being normal high school students or trying to be normal high school students. Up, up to that point of your sophomore year, what impact did coaches have on you, both uh, performance-wise and personally? As a young person, I think our biggest influence was our brother because he was unusual and he had us train a certain way that probably is the reason we became world record holders in our sport. We were world record holders in different sports. I want to give credit to my brother because of the training methods he applied for us to develop a mindset that could handle just about anything someone threw at us. When we were very young and he had a double paper route, he would wake us up at four o'clock in the morning to get us out of bed to run the newspapers up on each side of the street for him while he rode the bike. We ran then, but we were not runners. And then we went to swim practice. When we had an off season, our 12 yard pool in the backyard became our training ground. And so our brother would have us stand back to back in the front yard. He'd start us, we'd run in the opposite direction. And in Phoenix, going around three blocks and coming back is an is actual mile. So we would have us race each other in a mile. And whoever got back first got an ice cream, and the person who lost had an extra set of workout in the backyard pool. 
So we shared the ice cream and we shared the extra set in the swimming. Then our brother had us do something called centurions. Don't do this at home. We would dive into the pool, swim freestyle, do a flip turn, swim butterfly back, pull ourselves out of the pool, land on our feet. We couldn't land on our knees. Run to the fence, come back, do 10 men's push-ups, and then get in, dive in and do the same thing over again for an entire 60 minutes. Wow. Yeah. And that is probably why our heart and our circulatory system were phenomenal by the time we were adults. And then it just took a few years for the legs to catch up with the rest of us in college. What were your expectations when you joined the running teams at university? It's a, it's a different way of thinking again. If you place the expectation on something, typically what can happen is you can get complacent or you can get intimidated. To focus on the process of performance tasks and then allowing that to unfold and then having a strategy of pace that swimming allowed for me to develop, I could predict my time. Then I would actually cross the finish line hitting that time. But my, what I call my first year of running, my first track season of running, I was able to predict my times and then cross the finish line doing that. My very first mile was a 525. Your first season was cross country? No, track. I started in February. The first meet was the middle of February. I wasn't yet um, broken in when I did my first race. 800 and 1500 was such a good way to start running instead of cross country. I think if I had attempted cross country, I probably wouldn't have liked the 5,000 meters without a base and might not have lasted. My encouragement for people is start out with track before you continue with cross country and start with shorter distance races to build up your speed, your kick, so that you'll have that at the end as you build your, your endurance. You'll actually maintain your kick. What was your view? Were you paying attention and aware of the wider world of running when you started the USA runners and the world athletes? No, we weren't really intimidated at all. We worked out on the swim team, the Arizona Desert Rats, and the people that we were surrounded by were Olympians and All-Americans and very talented swimmers. So walking on to another sport, when we were younger, we saw these champions as wonderful human beings. And so we didn't really think, oh, this is intimidating. We just enjoyed the fact that we could join something and, and learn how to do it properly and enjoy the friendships that were built and together create a wonderful experience doing our best. You have a distinctive and somewhat different than a lot of athletes perspective on performance. Did you set goals? In that in those first years of running? Oh, I think it's more like an aim. And if I use the mantra, what's the smartest thing I can do today? And you do that pretty consistently. Your outcome will probably be at its best. And so when lobster was the incentive, if in case anyone qualified for nationals, Joy and I, for two years in a row, were able to collect lobster dinners and then he changed it to an ice cream I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that incentive program. Was that an, <laughs> an Arizona thing? Yes. Joy and I both um, enjoyed the, the lobster dinners. I think it was tied into where it was actually part of actually eating at Nationals, and that was a seafood restaurant, and we were able to have the lobster because of the per diem for that And at the time. Now, remember, this is a long time ago when food wasn't as expensive as it is now. Now it would be probably a violation. Because the lobster now is way more expensive. That was the kind of incentives that we had. So it was really more of a good-natured, fun invitation as opposed to, oh, I'm going to try to make it into the final or I'm going to try to set a record. The records were a byproduct of the process. It started with school records and then progressed to collegiate records. And then it went to American and world record. But they were outcomes of towing the line 
to do your best, then they happened. So it was quite fun, actually, without all the pressure. And we didn't tell people what we were going to do because that's silly. It's like opening a Christmas gift early. If you do that, they expect it. And then if you don't create that performance, people are disappointed. And then if you do, it was something they already expected. It loses its. So being able to be quiet about your own performance, I think, is a really healthy way to go into a race. It takes all the pressure off and really lets it unfold. And then everyone can enjoy it together. Very nice sentiment. Did you find your teammates aligned with this way that you approach performance and the people that you raced against from other schools, did you get to know any and did you find alignment with them or differences? So, so first I want to smile because picture running against someone on a track meet. When the gun goes off, some people are running one way, some people are running the opposite direction. It was- wouldn't happen. So when we race, we're racing in the same direction with the same common goal of doing our best. And we felt that way as real for us. So we could encourage people to do well. We could actually encur- cheer for them, encourage them, and become friends with them. I would say a majority of the people that we raced with became good friends because we had that ability to not look at the person as an obstacle or a restriction, but an invitation of a really great neighborhood. When you think of leaders next to each other linking arms, Instead of having a leader and a follower, that's real. And that's how neighborhoods are built. That's how relationships are built. And I think good business practices are built. We were very lucky to have that other people receptive to that friendship with us. Did you have any performances then that surprised you that were beyond what you had decided or felt that you would do or came up short of what you saw you were going to do? The story that I'm going to share with you is profound. My eyes will probably water. Three very important people in my life died of awful situations in a very short span of time while I was racing. I I went to the Crow Nationals at Madison Square Gardens in New York in 1982. That was in January, just a couple of weeks after a coach for the men's team who I had a tremendous amount of respect for. And then two of my dear friends, one a teammate from Quest Club and the other one, an an athlete from Minnesota who had come out for spring break, had trained, and then we had raced with each other and had shared the lead in races where she had the same mindset as I did. And so these were very close relationships. And when they died, a drunk driver, a high school kid on drugs, and, and, a, and a suicide at a track shed, these were very hard for me, and, and I was incredibly sad. You can imagine going to nationals. I didn't have any real energy for nationals, I, and I honestly didn't even feel like I was at nationals. And, and I had an Italian meal three hours before the race, if that lets you know how I... It wasn't the norm for me. And so on the line, I felt sluggish. And I just talked to the three of them and said, you guys, I can't do this by myself. I really need your help. I I love you guys. The first half of the race, I felt so bad. I was so heavy sitting in the bucket. This is a wood track. It's at Madison Square Gardens. And I'm back in the field. I'm not anywhere near the lead. And I'm trying to accomplish this 3,000-meter race. And about halfway through, all of a sudden, it felt like I was being lifted off the track and I was barely touching the track. I, and I kid you not, it felt like they were actually had lifted me up. And I started to move through the pack, but it wasn't me doing it. I can honestly say I was not alone in that effort. I continued to move through the pack. I think either one or two laps to go, I ended up in the lead. I crossed the finish line. And again, remember that it didn't feel like I was at nationals. I was very depleted from the sorrow I felt for these three. I didn't do a victory lap. In fact, I stopped just past the finish line. Brenda Webb, I think, pushed me as she finished. And then I just walked into the infield to get my jacket and was putting it on, oblivious of my performance. A friend came up and said, Jones, you know, my gosh, oh my gosh, you broke the world record. 
and I looked at him as a prankster and said, oh, very funny. And he goes, oh, no, look at the board, look at the board. And as I looked up and saw WR, a photographer got my face from the side with my eyes bugging out and my mouth wide open. I was completely stunned. That was a world record, but I had broken the world record at the two mile in the indoor nationals. And that was definitely a surprise, but I can say that they broke the world record and I went along for the ride. That's an amazing story. Willie Williams, Kathy Gibbons, Jackson, and Rocky Reset. Three incredible people that I'm grateful to have them in this podcast. Nice. Thank you for telling that. What happened after that race with the rest of your career as you finished university? So I ended up on U.S. teams and raced. I was part of Athletics West after University of Arizona. And at the time, and, and there's no bitterness here when I share this. It's important for people to understand that. In, in the time period that I raced, their emphasis by Athletics West and Nike was to spotlight individuals, Carl Lewis, Edwin Moses, Mary Decker. And so they swallowed up a lot of women onto the team, but we were not promoted. We were hidden somewhat intentionally. I didn't know it at the time at all, but it just, things happened and I keep scratching my head. When 1982, after doing the indoor season and setting the world record and having performed very well, I was invited to New York to be a part of Mademoiselle. And they did a big feature on Beth Hyden, who was a speed skater cyclist, Jamie Kurlander, who was a pro skier, and myself as a track athlete. When I didn't want the guy to cut my hair and I had a brown recluse spider bite on my forehead. It was pretty, you know what a brown recluse wound was? Yeah, happen? that's not something that you'd wish on anybody. And so I had a pretty bad headache there, but the people were so wonderful. And I suppose that I um, impressed them with the fact that the, that headache and everything didn't phase me. I enjoyed being there with them. And the photo shoot went very well. And they wanted me to join Eileen Ford modeling agency. But when I called Athletics West to tell them that good news, isn't that wonderful? I'll be able to give us more visibility. They told me I had an exclusive contract and could not sign. And that was my first discovery, but not recognition that I was not given permission to be known in the public eye. Wow. Were you getting a regular stipend then just for expenses? I had a four-year contract. And so that contract went through the Olympics. At the time, again, I didn't realize that wasn't going to be a cultivation of my talent to thrive. It was going to be the, the hiding is the best way to put it. The example that comes to mind for people will probably be the 1984 Olympic 3000 meter final. Let's talk about the trials. Okay. Do you remember the Olympic trials for the 84 Olympics? <laughs> yes, I do very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. To help you understand what I accomplished by doing the smartest thing I could every day. I had compartment syndrome in the posterior part of my calf. There's a lot of parallels here. Mary Decker Blaney had compartment syndrome in the anterior portion of her shin. Hers you can operate on because it's one sheath. Mine is multiple layers you can't. So I ended up in the pool and on the bike to, to heal up from the posterior compartment syndrome. While I was on the bike on February 10th of 1984, it was at the university and I was training. A woman in front of me with big baskets on the back of her bike suddenly stopped and I couldn't miss her. I collided. When the front wheel turned and I fell onto my tailbone and fell out into the street and the car was inches from my head as it went by and I couldn't get up. Wow. So as I oh. fell out into the street, the fire department came and put me on a spine board and took me to the hospital because I couldn't move. The good news is, I say good news is when the tailbone broke, it, it paralyzed my back when the muscles locked up. And so they took me to the hospital. They gave me muscle relaxants. I was there overnight. And then the next day I got out, of, I was walking like someone who might be 90. 
I was walking really slowly. My friend picked me up from the hospital and took me back to my home. Athletes tend to think differently than non-athletes in terms of recovery. And so I was moving around a little bit. And my friend, Valentine's Day, thought it would be great to get me out of the house to go shopping for groceries since I had been running low. So I went with this person in the car, seatbelt on. And as we're driving along, and of course, I'm not moving very well, but as we're seated in this car, two high school students are in a car getting distracted with each other driving. And the high school student decided to take a U-turn by turning a U-turn to the left from the far right lane. And we were next to her, uh, just slightly back. And so she T-boned my door. And as she was doing that, I, I attempted to escape the car impact. And that sent me back into the hospital again. That's two accidents in four days. I, I was able to get out of the hospital again. Then I could start running again mid-March a month later. And then two weeks later, my first race was at the Willie Williams Memorial Classic. I ran uh, 9.42, which would not help me get to the Olympics, but I qualified for the Olympic standard the previous summer in Europe. Remember 9.42. That was the end of March. In June, at the Olympic trials, I went 8.41, a minute and a second faster. We had three heats in five days. I finished third with that 8.41. And then I had six more weeks to train for the Olympics. So I was ecstatic because I actually was going to be even faster at the Olympics because I had that additional time to train. And we had predicted 8.42 at the Olympic trials when I went 841. And in the Olympics, uh, my workouts indicated 836. Women have this thing called a menstrual cycle that can slow us down by about three seconds. So that was my range was 836 if I'm not and 839 if I am. And I wasn't. And I was actually on pace for 836 in that race in the Olympics before another thing happened. <laughs> yeah. Okay. When I publish this, there's a lot of documentary and interviews and writing about that race. There's one video that, that shows the entire race with commentary. How do you remember that race? At the time, I wasn't sure exactly what happened other than I sensed there was someone who was backing into me. So I moved out for that person. And then all of a sudden, the next thing I know... There's movement from her and then I'm on the ground. But when it's happening, I didn't realize I was falling. I felt someone going down and at, this is the twin part again. And it's, again, unless you're a multiple, a twin, a triplet or quadruplet, people may not get this. But when I felt someone falling, I actually was sad for that person going down because this was such an important race for her. And, and you then didn't realize was, it was you at first. Until I was at knee height. I realized I was falling, and so I really couldn't stop my fall. And so I impacted my solar plexus on the ground, and it knocked my air out. And that was the first time and only time I've ever had that happen. It's, a, it's stunning when it happens because you can't get any air. You can't breathe. And so all I saw were my friends up ahead, and I wanted to catch back up with them. So I hopped off the track, and this is probably from all those workouts in the backyard pool, coming out of the pool, getting up and running to the fence, right? I think I trained for that moment. <laughs> so I ended up running, including the fall. I think it was a 71 second lap, which meant it was faster than that to try to catch up, but I couldn't breathe. So it took approximately 200 meters for the ability to breathe again. And so I was either going to pass out or I was going to be able to continue racing. Unfortunately, I got to finish the race, so I didn't pass out. But the outcome of that oxygen debt was brutal. My last lap, I think, was a 78 or and I finished in 851. I did the best I could for those conditions, but I would have gotten the silver medal. I'm clear I would have ended up with the silver medal. I knew Mary had an Achilles injury at the time and wasn't able to kick 
because of her Achilles injury. And Puika is a much better kicker than I would have been. It would have been a wonderful race with everybody not having outcomes that they get. Do you remember your strategy for the race? Had you planned it? When you fell, you were in the back of the pack, I think. No, I was actually working my way through the pack. So at the very beginning, if you watch the race from the BBC, they do a better job of showing it than Marty LaCoria with the U.S. version because the U.S. had to go off a storyboard and they didn't really know a lot of the other athletes from Europe and other countries. So the show was this newcomer Zola Bud and Mary. And so that's what they really just focused on. And so you didn't get to see the nuances of that race unless you see the British commentary. And then they know more of the athletes. And so you get to see these individuals. And so in that race, I would negative split my races. That's how I ran. Because I negative split, that means that every lap I'm going to get faster. So instead of wasting energy racing people, I'm going to be able to finish my race with acceleration, but I'm not going to decelerate any part of that race. And so it's very difficult for other people to be able to go along with me because they went out very hard. They went out very hard. They were on world record pace in extremely hot conditions. So I knew as soon as they did that, that this was a a fantastic situation for me. I knew that there were a few of us that held back, but most people didn't. So I knew that race was going to be outstanding until what happened. I negative split, and you can see that I'm working my way through the pack, and the last mile is when I go. And so I would have been up there right with them, and it would have been after Mary's fall. I wouldn't have been any part of that. And so I wouldn't have had any of that disruption. I would have been able to have a really clean line to work through people and not be out in lane four or lane three, wasting energy. It's a very nice analysis. It's something that's, of course, uh, overlooked by the dramatic attention paid to the Bud Decker. That was a perfect storm that was created. So what people don't realize is Mary had four Olympics that she was not able to have a good outcome from. The first one, she was too young. She was good enough to have qualified, but she was too young. The second one, I believe she had an injury. The third one was a boycott. And the fourth one was the fall. And so without giving her any chance to de... What do they call it in war when you have to get someone down from a very hard situation? I don't know what the term for that is, but decompress maybe. Has an opportunity to decompress and a microphone put right in front of her face. People then judged her. What they thought was crying over this event. And I honestly think it was her sadness of having four of those happen like she's cursed. So. I I like to give her the benefit of that doubt because she's different than everyone else in the spectator realm. She knows her feelings, and the rest of us can only speculate. How long did it take you to process or decompress that and get a perspective that you have on it today? When I was in the stands after the race and I looked and saw the results, I was not around other people that I knew. As soon as I saw that the bronze medal was won in 842, and I saw the silver was 839, and I saw Puika running 835 point, tears immediately started, and I just unleashed. A person from the stands came running up and gave me this big bear hug, and I don't know who it is, but it was so amazing that someone who I didn't even know would have that much compassion to do that. That was amazing. Not the part about the results, but the empathy, the caring, that connection was beautiful. Then when I saw my family and they all came up and gave me the big hug, dad said, honey, is there anything I can do to help you feel better? I said, Dad, you can quit smoking. He quit smoking, which is an award. 
any Olympian could possibly have. And he lived to the age of 92. Oh my gosh. It's a beautiful outcome of two things. Uh, when we were in the car and we were at the crosswalk waiting as people were going by, a friend of mine, Steve Lunkler, who I had trained over at SMU with my coach, Robert Bond, and Steve Lunkler, who was a swimmer at SMU and on the Olympic team as a breaststroker. He saw me and came over and scooped me out of the window. He literally scooped me out of the car to give me a big hug because he had seen what happened. Those are the kinds of caring responses that make something that is a tough situation so much better. The beauty of what happened to me is that I could go help kids understand that life doesn't always provide you with the best situation, but it's what your approach is that you do. And it's the relationships you have that really make life worth it. And to not ever give up on whatever it is that you're doing. I would not have had that example if not for that 84 Olympics. That's pretty amazing. As you set your sights on the next Olympics, what was your relationship with Addicts, Athletics West and that restrictive relationship you had? What happened in the next four years? I know it's a, it, this is a really fascinating part of your story to me. So let's go back to the Olympics in 84 because I think this sets the tone. After the race, when I went into the women's bathroom, one of the staff people for Athletics West came in and then saw me and goes, isn't that terrible what happened to Mary? And I said, yes, it was terrible. And then she said, how did you do? And I said, I fell. And she had no awareness that I had fallen. But then I had requested the ability to stay at the Olympics for the closing ceremonies because this being my first Olympics and no one's ever guaranteed another one, that would be so wonderful to stay for the closing ceremonies. And they shipped me out the next morning. I was on the plane with Zola Bud. They didn't want me around because I would have been a comparison for the situation that happened to Mary. And so the ghost of back and field was on an airplane going to Europe in racing. And that's what wow. happened. Then at, at the end of 1984, Joy and I both had been world record holders and Joy had been in modern pentathlon and was going into triathlon and had already shown herself in triathlon to do very well professionally. So we both went in to talk with Phil Knight about the idea of having us sponsored by where Joy wouldn't just get product, but she could actually get a stipend like I did and have the same benefits that I did. He felt that she could do well with just product. So there was a, an individual at ASICS who I had not understood had worked at Nike and knew when Nike's cutoff date was. So he was going to sign us to an ASICS contract and we were going to sign it at the end of December. And he talked us into waiting until after the early part of January because he had an inventory. And unbeknownst to us, that when you don't re-sign your contract with Nike and you leave them, you can't come back. And the A6 guy ended up pulling that money that was going to go for Joy and me and adding it to Steve Scott's contract. And the irony of that is that Steve Scott is a friend of ours. And we were all in Arizona and we were on the Runner's World cover together. And the irony was here it is, the three of us with ASICs and one was able to continue and the other ones weren't. Wow. That brings us to 1988. Now you're going to be in Seoul, Korea. It's not as big of a marketing opportunity as the Los Angeles Olympics were. And so I lived in San Diego. And at that time, I submitted packets out to a lot of different companies locally in San Diego. And one company gave me an interview. It was a financial planning group. And that financial planning group sponsored me, which was terrific. And then I shared with them that there were other athletes who were in the same kind of situation that I was. What about opening this up and starting a nonprofit? I'll be the spokesperson. I'll give you a lot of visibility. You start up the 501c3 and then I'll be the spokesperson. And when I come back after it's all over, I will run the company. And they said, yes. I went away and trained and came and did a lot of media for them. And then 
I came back with my twin sister and did another media push. And we were in magazines, television, newspapers, the works. And I asked them about the 501c3 and was asking questions to see it and to learn other things from it. And they would not show me anything. So I ended up going to the Chamber of Commerce. I found out there was no 501c3. And I had a decision to make, and that was the end of March. And so the next day on April 1st, that's a true, <laughs> April 1st, I went in and filed a 501c3 and stopped training for the Olympics. And I was able to help 13 athletes get help through my nonprofit. And then the visibility went towards that instead of the company. And I didn't bring that to attention at the time because if I had brought their antics, what they had done or didn't do or whatever, it would have dissolved everything from being anything positive. And so we were able to help out 13 athletes. A bank building was donated, all of the utilities, volunteers, the works was all part of it. No salaries. Everyone did this out of genuinely wanting to help the local athletes. And then as a thank you, we as the athletes, not me so much, but I did the volunteer work with them, but we did the volunteer work as a thank you for the local community helping out. So it was a really it's, nice endeavor. That w decision was you ending your possible participation in the Olympics, not because of your training, not because not at of the shape you were in. Oh, no, I was in shape. I was so excited. I was looking forward to it. Again, Joy and I think in such a way that the core of who you are matters more than the appearance. It, it just is who we are. And on our deathbed, if you've lived a great life from an authentic place, you don't look at anything from regret and you have a peacefulness onto whatever the next place is. It was a decision I made that evening, that night, and it was the right decision to make. It was more important to be able to do something good from a good place than it was to know that there had been a scam and to stay quiet and not. What they did is they raised money. They, they got money from their clients. They could put some into helping the athletes, but if they didn't, no one knows. Just knowing they had filed the 501c3 was disturbing for me. So I went ahead and, and took care of it as an actual person with my name on it and another person signing. We were able to make sure that things were ethically done and caring for the athletes as it, it was designed to do. <laughs> That's the kind of story that is deserving to put you on the front of a magazine. That's another great story and so, it's very inspirational. We'll pause here for part one with Joan Hansen. Back in part two, you won't want to miss it. More great stories. I hope you enjoyed another episode of Running in the 70s. Voices, stories, and memories of athletes who were running in the 70s. Until next time, wherever you are, keep looking forward and don't forget to look back.